Whether you're single or not, there are massive cultural shifts that have made dating and relationships more difficult than ever. Over the last few months, I've researched and talked to multiple experts on why it's so hard to date nowadays for both men and women, the loneliness epidemic, and what the solution is for us individually and as a society. And firstly, I talked to Chris Williamson as someone who's interviewed countless experts, academics, and researchers on this topic. Would you say we're in a dating crisis? And if so, why? I think that we're absolutely in a mating crisis at the moment between men and women. So there's a few big movers. Uh, some of them are kind of obvious and not that controversial and others are a lot more controversial. So one of the maybe more surprising big movers has been women's increase in socioeconomic status. So women are out earning and out educating men up to about the age of 30. And the problem is that women fundamentally want to date men on average, who are at least as educated or more and at least as wealthy or more than they are. So what this amounts to, when you have two women for every one man completing a four-year U.S. college degree by 2030, men have retreated from the U.S. labor force by 0.1% every month since 1950 until today, from a high of 87 to a low of 67% now. It means that it amounts to a diminishing pool of potential mates for women. If women are outperforming men, socioeconomically, but fundamentally women want to date men that are socioeconomically the same or higher than them, you have an ever-increasing cohort of high-performing women or an ever-decreasing cohort of ultra-high-performing men. So these men that sit below that are largely invisible to women. They kind of retreat into porn and video games and weed and social media and screens. These women, this big chunk of women here, feel kind of used and discarded by the turbo chads at the top they then retreat into a boss bitch lifestyle uh maybe they convince themselves that they don't want to have a partnership maybe that's true that very well may be true uh and then these guys at the top i don't think that it's fantastic for them either i mean they have this wealth of options but it's kind of like offering a four-year-old ice cream for dinner every single night even if it's what they might want it's not necessarily what's good for them and this relationship this dynamic between them all is what I've called the tall girl problem, which is on average women want to date a man who is 21 centimeters taller than she is. That means that if you're a six foot tall woman without heels on, you're looking at professional athletes, right? If you want to wear heels on your wedding day, you're looking at guys that are really, really tall. So as women rise up through their own competence hierarchy, they struggle to look across and see many eligible partners on the male side. So that's one. Right. That's that's one of the more controversial ones. Some of the more obvious ones are that if men can get sexual satisfaction from porn, that doesn't incentivize them to go out and find a partner in order to be sexually satisfied. Right. So watching porn might not be anywhere near as pleasurable as having genuine sex, but it's pleasurable enough to tamp down that sexual drive that they have to go forward. If you were to look at some of the things that make men eligible partners, right? Goal seeking, a desire for mastery and camaraderie and, and conquering and achieving and gaining status. A lot of that can be achieved through video games, right? You can, you've got your clan, you've got your group of people that you play with, you level up, you achieve new goals, you go after things. So it's my belief that male reproductive seeking and goal seeking behavior has been hijacked by poor and video games and this is the male sedation hypothesis that i've come up with as well which is actually being featured in my first ever academic paper soon which feels uh, pretty cool so um those are two big chunks of it um you know there's there's other things that have occurred uh post uh, sexual revolution with a contraceptive pill there's some really strange externalities that have come out of that um i think many women have been told that genuine freedom is having sex like their brother and working like their father. And I'm not convinced that that is genuinely empowering. I mean, maybe it's the case that the patriarchy is so powerful that they've managed to con women into not only giving up sex without commitment, but also being the primary breadwinner so that men can stay at home, work part-time and play COD. I don't know. Um, but I, I think that there are a lot of um, very negative messages being given from the culture to both men and women. And I, I think that everybody is confused. A lot of people are very lonely. Everyone is incredibly isolated. So for the majority of men, the experience is simply that they're not being seen. They're not being swiped on because they don't hit the requirements of six feet, six figures, and six pack. 
On the flip side, the challenges that women go through are different. And this is a clip from Chris's podcast, Modern Wisdom, where he interviewed Matthew Hussey, who is one of the top, if not the top dating coach for women. I want something meaningful. I want something that's actually going to go somewhere. And this person is just kind of stringing me along or they can't seem to... They, a lot of people wouldn't frame it like this person stringing me along because that kind of is a hard thing to admit. But they may say this person keeps saying they're not ready and they're just not quite there yet and they're not sure. And so I think the indecisiveness of men and the inability to actually commit is, that's got to be the top one, I would say. And finally, I guess, round out with online dating. Constraints on choice are often actually very uh, satisfying to us. If you have an unlimited number of options, the level of satisfaction you have with your uh, final decision often decreases rather than increases. It's kind of counterintuitive because you think, well, I can pick precisely the exact outcome that I'm looking for here. But the alternative is that if you pick anything that isn't completely perfect, it was exclusively your fault, right? It was on you. You had 20 million potential partners on Tinder and you chose the wrong one. So it's all your fault. If you actually constrain the uh, options for yourself you're not always what's called nexting which is looking for someone that could come up next there's a smallest issue and again that gets reinforced by culture you know if you have a, a minor disagreement if your partner comes from a different political party to you it, whatever it might be that you should get rid of them because there is always someone waiting in the wings so yeah a wealth of options sometimes creates a poverty of satisfaction there's a really funny story that i think perfectly highlights this i've seen multiple female friends swipe on dating apps before and it is ruthless vicious unforgiving they look at the first picture for half a second and immediately swipe left you know what half a second is generous they just go boom 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 and maybe they read the bio maybe they give you a second maybe they look at the second picture and there's one friend in particular that i was living with at the time during the pandemic and we were each other's wingman and wingwoman swiping on dating apps and finally, she got to this guy. She was looking at his profile. He was good looking. The bio made her laugh. She looked at the next picture. It was friends. He was well off, making money. He had good humor, good values, nothing creepy. And she swipes left. And I'm like, what? Hold, hey, stop. What? Why did you just, why did you swipe left? Like he had everything. He had all the things. He was tall, good looking, had his money together, had friends, was funny. And she hesitated looked at me and said, yeah, I know. But in that one picture, he had really small teeth. Imagine this. You can do everything right. Work on your physique, get your wardrobe together, make money, be funny, have everything. But if you got small teeth and she happens to not like it, you're out. The funny thing is, Stephen Bartlett had a very similar experience that he shared on the podcast before. She was... um on a dating app, she hates dating apps, but she was on a dating app. Bear in mind, she's a mid thirties woman. Um, and there was this wonderful, like this really like wonderful guy. He's a nicely mannered guy. And she said, I'm not interested in him. I said, why? She goes, look at the background of his hinge or whatever it was photo. There's boxes on top of his cupboard. Uh. And that was her reason for this. Like, I thought, I was like, that's a really good guy. He's got a great job. Seems really nice. He's been really polite to her. And the reason why she didn't want to be with him was because there was a box on the wardrobe behind him in the Tinder picture. This is what frustrates me about modern dating. And you used the word ick before, so I know you're familiar with it, but the ick has become this trend. Only where, because of her. Oh, you know about it from her. Okay, she, so she, she says ick to me. So pe for people listening who haven't heard of it, the ick is this new trendy word that basically means the reason why all of a sudden you're not interested in someone. And so my friend is the comedian Jared Freed, and he does hilarious bits about this. And so he travels around the country asking women for their icks. And one of them is, you're having an amazing date. You want to go home with the guy. It's time to pay the bill. You open, you you pull out your wallet and you hear, Shh, he has a Velcro wallet. <laughs> the ick, you're not sleeping with him. And he has these hilarious bits. One woman told him, my ick was that I was on a date with a guy and I imagined him being late for his bus and running for the bus and I could never be with him. And Jared's like, to be clear, there was no bus and there was no running. And she's like, I just imagined it. This is a meme that I saw where there's a woman being interviewed 
and she talks about some sort of ick. I did discover that your biggest ick is men holding umbrellas. There's something about it that just feels really pathetic. And then it switches to this notes app of this guy who scrolls to the very bottom out of like hundreds of reasons that he noted down of things not to do to ick a woman. And it just highlights how we set these unrealistic expectations that make it nearly impossible to find someone that we even give a chance. On top of all that, I think in general, we have less touch points or chances to meet new people. You may have heard of this idea of having a third place, right? The first place being your home. This is where you spend a lot of your time. Second place is your work, where you spend most of your time. And then third place would be a social setting that is separate from the home and work and is characterized by social interaction outside of the people you live with or work with. That would be a bar, a cafe, or a barbershop, or just a community center, just something where you would go out, you'd hang out, and you would meet new people. Yes, nowadays it may be the gym, but who's really socializing in the gym and meeting new people? And on top of that, I feel like a lot of us have actually lost the second place, which is the place that we go to work to, right? Because we do remote work, we spend our time in Zoom meetings, and that's where we interact with people, and it's still just the same group of people. So unless you have a hobby that involves other people that requires you to leave the house and that is a hobby that actually has potential new mate options, so Dungeons and Dragons doesn't count, just the amount of new exposure to people that you have that you could date is just so limited. Now you throw all of these challenges into one giant pot, you stir it up, you have a soup of separation, loneliness, sexless people that are having less intimacy than ever. And it creates this culture where men and women are no longer collaborators, but adversaries. There's a, a generalized anti-mating culture, right? Men and women don't need each other. Uh, you know, the, the men and women largely are taught that the other sex is an adversary to be avoided or a resource to be used and discarded, right? Um, I don't think that that is really helping at all. Men and women are taught that they don't need each other, that they can survive without them. Like, men are trash. Uh, hold on tight, boys. The sex robots are coming. You know, like, pick your meme, whether it's MGTOW or Boss Bitch, whether it's Red Pill or r slash female dating strategy. What you're seeing is this sort of fractured kaleidoscope of different movements trying to comfort men and women who are struggling in the, the mating market. And they kind of feel like something is wrong and they don't really understand why. And then stophavingkids.org is this massive movement, the antinatalist movement at the moment. Like you shouldn't have kids and marriage doesn't matter. And you know, you just all the way down are a bunch of retreats that people make because they're fundamentally mating is, is difficult. Let's have a look at stophavingkids.org. The best way to avoid hell is to never be born. Sounds like a great solution. Life is tough at times. Let's just end it all and literally throw out the baby with the bathwater. It is usually the case that humans have children for reasons rooted in egocentrism. Those who procreate don't acknowledge that the future person they are creating may not want to be born and may even one day wish they had never been born. I've had those days. By the way, thanks mom and dad for doing the thing. So there's that. I'm sure they're going to change a lot of minds. On top of that, we also see that in mainstream media and culture and Hollywood movies that are becoming more and more devoid of love and romance because who needs that? That's just made up, be it in the new Barbie movie or the new Snow White movie, which is a classic romantic story of a prince saving a princess. But the creators of the new Snow White movie had a bit of a different idea than Walt Disney. You said you were bringing a modern edge to it on stage. What do you mean by that? The original cartoon came out in 1937, yes. and very evidently so. <laughs> um, there is a big focus on her love story um, with a guy who literally stalks her. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Super weird. Super weird. So we didn't do that this time. <laughs> Walt didn't know that Prince Charming is actually just a stalker. Can you imagine the effects this will have on children and what they start to believe about relationships and the world out there. Listen, I get it. It is important to teach children about stranger danger, but imagine they go watch a movie like this and they believe that's what relationships are like. That's what it's like when men and women are pursuing each other. It's creepy. It's wrong. It is disempowering for the woman. And I see it in my personal life as well, in my social circles of 
people cheering each other on for not needing anyone. Like, oh, just be happy by yourself. And you can't really be happy in a relationship unless you're happy by yourself. Part of that is true. But I think a lot of people are using it as an excuse to never put themselves out there, to never go approach that girl or risk getting rejected by that guy that you're after. And then you just have two dogs and a cat and you walk them, you work from home and you watch Netflix. And that's your entire life. That's your 20s. And you're empowered, you're independent, you don't need anyone, and life is okay. But it's not fully fulfilling. And on the flip side, same thing with guys who are not even trying anymore. They don't even put themselves out there because it seems futile. And I saw a clip of Sadia Khan, who I think hit the nail on the head. When you feel like you can't access something, the best and quickest way to defend your ego is to pretend you don't want it. When you feel like you're not worthy of love, the quickest and easiest way to feel worthy is to pretend love is terrible, pretend love is toxic. And I see this a lot in red pill men and really high, like a proud feminist. Both cohorts tend to be people who personally probably believe that they're not desirable to the opposite gender so the only way to get rid of that feeling of un like being un undesired is to pretend you don't desire the opposite gender so i see it both and they're almost a perfect match for each other that blue haired you know uh, feminist and that red pill guy they're almost a perfect match because they both almost have the same pathologies when it comes to their understanding of love so they're they should get together i think it's a great uh, business idea actually blue hair redneck dating.com is it possible that our generation is just pretending that we don't need each other because we're afraid that it's not accessible? Because we see it from other people. We see all the clips online. We see these echo chambers. Everyone is non-committal. Nobody can be trusted. People are messing around. Nobody commits. There's endless options. I'm getting ghosted. So I'm going to ghost the next person. And it's just a cycle that we repeat to each other endlessly. And because we're afraid we exhibit the same behavior that makes other people hurt and afraid. When you can't get something, the best way to defend yourself is pretending you don't want it. Where else in my life am I doing that? Another cultural phenomenon right now in the dating sphere is these podcasts of one or two dudes who bring on seven girls and they just interview them to show the world out there what the dating market is really like. Specifically, the Fresh and Fit podcast and the Whatever podcast. So these are podcasts where there's a couple of guys who bring on seven or eight girls who are in different industries, but oftentimes they make content online that gets them a lot of money because they show skin. And watching these podcasts, you can't help but feel hopeless. Would you ever be loyal to a guy? I would be. I feel like I am sometimes. I am right now. Well, you can't, it's like no, loyal sometimes. Which <laughs> one? <laughs> what does that mean? Both, but what about the husband? I mean, I'm not fucking him. She's fucking John Zerka while married to a Mormon <laughs> bishop and she shoots and You couldn't say it any sex. better. And it's amazing. This clip went viral of me saying that I love cheating. It's actually my biggest fantasy. You want mm. to cheat on the guy or you want the guy to cheat on you? Either. I've watched maybe a few of these. I felt much worse afterwards because you end up in this echo chamber where you start only seeing that and it's this is not what's out there this is not normal this is not the real world body count over 9000 and the women they bring on are not exactly a great average of the women that are out there and even though you logically know there's other women out there the women that i have in my life they're very different from this you can't help but shift your mind in a certain direction where you're like wow it is very challenging nowadays. We live in very challenging times. It makes you wanna not date. And if you do, then not really let someone get close because they may screw you over. And on these podcasts, they're just debating on why women are doing this wrong or men are doing that wrong. And they're just like at each other's throats. There's just an increased sense of disgust for the opposite sex where men feel like women can't be trusted and they're illogical, they can't be dealt with, and they'll betray you, take all your money, and never get married. And on the flip side, the guys don't commit, they're just ick, there's just no good men out there. And of course, then you have Andrew Tate as the messiah of the manosphere, or this, this red pill movement of like, get your money up, don't commit to these women, and anti-feminism, right? Which, to be fair, I know why he's successful, I know why it exists, and 
could there be better male role models out there? Just a question. Just a question I'm asking here. And it seems like the pendulum has swung very far to the side where there's hookup culture, people are just messing around, nobody commits, and we're not having kids. We're all separated and lonely, and everyone is just looking after themselves. But then it also feels like this pendulum is swinging back with a kind of movement of more conservatism, more and more people choosing faith and religion, and waiting to get married, and only then sleeping with someone. Even in my social circle, I've had friends who recently became Christians. And not just because, oh, this like helps with dating, but no, they're full on faithful and go to church and they believe in God and they have given their life to the Lord, as they would say. So we're in a dating crisis. How do we deal with this as an individual and as a society? Yeah, good to split it up because I think that there's largely two uh, two broad buckets of changes that need to happen. Uh, first off, as a society, we need to reduce this adversarial nature between the sexes. Men and women need to be taught that they're fundamentally uh, collaborators and compatriots, not competitors and enemies. Um, so creating a pro-mating culture. Uh, I think that stopping derogating motherhood, you know, women that don't choose a career are often treated like second-class citizens that have been conned into being a domestic prostitute by the patriarchy. It's like, well, if you do that, if you if you make being a mother a second-class citizen, remember that they're literally creating the next generation of humans that everybody says that we're supposed to value. If you do that, inevitably, some non-insignificant proportion of people are then going to feel like, well, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe, maybe that does make me a second-class citizen. Um, so... On a broad level, I think, you know, we need to, people need to be very skeptical of the kind of dating advice that they get on the internet. Uh, I think that the red pill advice for men is largely a catastrophe. Uh, I think it benefits a small number of men at the expense of almost all other men. Uh, I don't think that the advice that women are being given largely on the internet is very good. Uh, Chelsea Connerboy in the New York Times last year wrote an article that was titled, Maternal Instinct is a Myth that Men Created which literally means that if you love your children, you've been conned by the patriarchy. Yeah, it's pretty It's pretty grim and gruesome stuff. There's articles in Cosmopolitan teaching you how to sleep with him and not catch feels. Okay, uh, so you're, you're teaching women how to disembody themselves from perhaps the most intimate act that you can do. Like, don't worry about those pesky emotions. We can get rid of those for you. It, it's just everything is kind of turning us into a uh, very sterile... Uh, unemotional creatures. And again, like I understand why this happens. And it, it, I was a club promoter for a decade and a half, right? Like I'm speaking to the previous version of me. Like I've been through the ringer of all of this stuff with regards to dating. So that's on a more macro level. On an individual level, there are an awful lot of things that people can do. So firstly, let's get into some general advice for both sexes and then for men and for women. First off, inhabit places where you're the rarer sex. So there is something called the sex ratio hypothesis. It's primarily the reason that college campuses are really terrible for women's dating prospect and really great for men's. Wherever you are the rarer sex, you have the power in the dating market, right? Because there is more demand than there is supply, right? That's a rough way that you could look at it. If you move from an area where there are lots of women as a woman to lots of men as a woman, guess what? You hold the power in the mating market. So you know, if you went to MIT to study robotics, you're going to be swimming in guys. It might not be precisely the kind of super chads that you're looking for, but th there'll be some in there. My point being that <clears throat> you can move yourself around like that. Another area uh, from a strategic perspective as a person, go to places that have people like the sort of people that you want to date. So if you're really big into fitness, guess what? Spend one month in a different gym every month for the next 12 months. Like that's a really, really powerful mating strategy because you like the gym. People that go to the gym also like the gym. Guess what? After 12 months, you will have found some people that you think are attractive. If you're into yoga or poetry or comedy or live music, just go to the places that would have the sort of person like the sort of person that you want to date. I want to show you two clips. One of Sajja Khan on the Modern Wisdom Podcast. We've become so greedy. We don't realize that some things have to involve a, a sacrifice. A healthy marriage has to involve 
sacrificing the alternatives we don't see the need to sacrifice alternatives because now we are so gluttonous even if we eat a lot we can still do that and get surgery even if we spend a lot we can still get credit cards we no longer see the sacrifice of alternatives as required in order for positive outcomes if you want a good healthy marriage unfortunately you might have to sacrifice the most exciting sexual experience every day of your life because that's what 20 years of marriage doesn't look like you know it's realistic and if you want like a, a single life then you have to accept that your emotional like you might suffer from anxiety and depression in the long run so you've got to realize whatever decision you make it comes with a lot of pain and suffering pick your pain so what if after all this time that we've been told not to settle it kind of is about that not settling in the sense that we're going for something we don't want but we cut the unrealistic expectations that make it impossible to find the person and be happy with the choice that we made my goal as a aspiring trophy husband in the future is to provide everything stability and excitement keeping them on their toes at the right moments in the right amounts being playful all of it but easier said than done we'll see and this clip is from logan yuri on the diary of a ceo podcast with stephen bartlett and she's the author of how to not die alone and so this is how I developed this framework that I want to tell you about called the three dating tendencies. And so really, this is the culmination of a lot of my research. The idea that I've worked with hundreds of people, now thousands of people in my classes, and most people suffer from one of these dating tendencies, or most people can be categorized into one of these three dating tendencies. What they each have in common is unrealistic expectations. So the first type is the romanticizer, and they have unrealistic expectations of relationships. So they're the person who really wants that meet cute. Their cousin met their boyfriend in high school and now they're married and they wanna have a romantic we met story. They don't wanna meet on an app. They believe that there's a soulmate, one person for life. As soon as a relationship hits a rough spot, they think must not be my soulmate because if it was my soulmate, it would be easy and effortless. The second type is the maximizer. The maximizer has unrealistic expectations of their partner. So this is the person, and I bet a lot of your listeners are maximizers, where they feel like the perfect person is only one search away. I need to keep searching for that person. I want the ambition of my ex-girlfriend plus the hotness of this other ex-girlfriend plus the really great family of this other person. And I can just wait until I find this Frankenstein version of the perfect person. And so they're always waiting and they have unrealistic expectations and they're waiting for the perfect person. The third type is the hesitator and they have unrealistic expectations of themselves. So they're not dating at all. So in their head, they fill in the blank. I'll be ready to date when? When I lose 10 pounds, when I get a more impressive job, when I clean up my apartment, when I go to therapy. I need to do these things to be lovable and then I can date. I can't date now because nobody would be interested in me. And so they sit at home, maybe trying to get better, maybe just thinking about trying to get better, but they're not actually dating. And they don't understand that the only way to get better at dating is by dating. And the only way to figure out who you wanna be with is by actually going on dates with people. Recently, I've come out of my hesitator phase and maybe now I'm switching into the maximizer phase, which is also not ideal, of course. I think it starts by defining what you're truly looking for and getting clear on that. And what's been really helpful for me is just defining the non-negotiables that I'm looking for in a partner. There's a lot of nice to haves right? There's a lot of things that like, oh, this is what I want them to be like. But what are the absolute musts where it is a deal breaker? And for me, there's only three things that I defined, which is number one, the growth minded makes sense because I mean, being really health conscious and a bit of a health nut is part of being growth minded. If you're exercising, going to the gym, eating healthy, that's part of you being into growth. And then thirdly, it's intelligence, right? I want to have stimulating conversations. Now, what she looks like whether she's blonde or brunette, white or black, or, you know, she's from a different nationality. I don't care. Like, I think I have certain types, but I've been proven wrong again and again, where I thought I like these types of women that look this way, but then they did the opposite, and I thought it was great too. So those are just limiting factors that decrease your pool so massively. And a lot of women that I've dated, I actually didn't fit their criteria at first, and prove them wrong. This is more like a general approach for both sexes. But there's also specific things for men and for women that individually will make a massive difference in your dating life and you being able to 
date people or just find that one person that you want to share your life with. Let's start ladies first. There's a few resources and stories that I would like to share with you that I'm a bit hesitant to put out there because it may be too powerful because it allows you to almost like put a spell on the man that you've been eyeing for a while that maybe is hesitant to commit, has a crush on you or maybe not yet, but if you know what buttons to push and how to approach it and the right mindset to go at it with, I mean, I've seen it work in real life. It is an absolute game changer. For the boys out there, I'm sorry. I have to share the secret that all men collectively know about and agree never to share. And it's sort of connected to what Chris shared with me. From women specifically, I think uh, in a post Me Too world, we've got uh, a lot of fears about safety uh, and women are very um, concerned about being approached. There's this really interesting like dichotomy that we have at the moment. 86% of women say that they want a man to make the first move, but 76% of men say that they're terrified of making the first move for being seen as creepy. 20% of Gen Z say that a man approaching a woman in person sometimes or always constitutes harassment, and 50% of men haven't approached a woman in the last year, aged 18 to 30. So you have this very difficult circle to square, which is women want to be approached but are scared of being approached. Men know that if they don't do the approaching that nothing is likely to happen, but that if they do do the approaching, they're maybe going to make her feel uncomfortable and maybe they get me too and it'll be bad. And, they do, and fundamentally, they're not a piece of shit, so they don't want to approach this woman and do this thing. Um, so one thing that I think is a good piece of advice for women to kind of get around this and also still keep themselves feeling safe is uh, to learn to be receptive uh, and to be um, like welcoming in some regards. Like if you see a guy in a bar that you think is nice, like allow your eyes to linger on him for a little bit longer. There's this cool story. Have you ever heard about dropping a napkin? So in the olden days, if a woman wanted to get a, a gentleman to begin speaking to her, she would walk past and perhaps accidentally drop her napkin on the floor. You know, like that's a, it's a very low stakes investment way. So what's the modern equivalent of dropping a napkin, right? We, we, th that would be something that I think uh, from a woman's perspective, if you want to be approached by the kinds of men that you want, if you inhabit a place where you're the rarer sex, if you spend time in areas that have people like the sort of person that you want to date, and if you cultivate a degree of receptivity, I think that you're really going to be, you're, you're going to be working very well there. Ladies, how do I put this? The fact that you are listening to this, getting curious about what can I do as a woman to be more approachable is, I think, the first step to you being able to pick and choose whatever guy you want. Because what I've found as a guy is that women have no idea what men want. For the boys out there, I want you to go out and ask a friend of yours, a female friend, what do men really want? What do you think? What do they really want? What do they really want on a deep level, emotionally? And what you'll find is that they give you the weirdest answers. I remember being in a car with two female friends and I asked both of them this question. And they thought for a while and one of them said, I think they just want to feel safe when they're around you. And the other friend, her answer was, I think they just want to be able to emotionally express themselves. And I just sat there in silence, just waiting for the reaction. They slowly looked at me like, and is, it, is that what they want? I just told them, listen, you just told me what you guys want. Women want to feel safe when they're in their boyfriend's presence and they want to be able to emotionally express themselves. Now, do I as a man want that too? It's like, well, yeah, I don't want to feel unsafe, but I tend to not feel unsafe around women because the girls that I'm dating, I'm physically stronger than them. I can snap them in half any second I choose to, which of course I don't. Why do I even have to say that? <laughs> and when it comes to emotionally express myself, sure, I want to be able to be myself around you. But when it comes to whining and complaining, I'm going to go to my guy friends for that. And of course, I'll share with you the things that are relevant for you, but that's not what I'm looking for in a partner. They had no clue. It's like they never even thought about it. And one of them was in a relationship and the other one was actively looking for one and was struggling at the time to lock down a guy. On the flip side, what I see is that there are tons of online forums, books, videos, podcasts, resources, scientific studies, diagrams, all of that stuff that men have studied on what women want. Because given that they're the gatekeepers of 
sex and intimacy, men had to figure that out. And the movies are always about what do women want? Nobody asks, what do the guys want? But the women who do and get curious about it and are open-minded and study it, when you learn what men truly want and you can give it to them, which is not that hard, to be honest, you can pick and choose whichever guy you want. You become irresistible. You put a spell on him that makes him feel like there's no other woman that can provide what you provide because generally they can't. And they got really curious. What is it that men want? What is it? And I told them what I believe men want, what, what I want in a woman. And it's really simple. It's somebody who's sweet, encouraging, caring, somebody that I don't know, I can be the hero for. What would happen to these girls if they studied what men want? Man, they would be unstoppable. They would be dangerous for any man that encounters them. And I witnessed it in real life with another friend of mine who was in the prime of his masculine existence, making good money, healthy, uh, happy. We we're throwing parties together to bring together our friends and meet new people. And he was in a spot where he was like, I just want to date around, have a bunch of experiences, and I don't want a relationship. Until he met this one girl, and I thought, this girl is amazing. I want to see them together. And I conspired with her, sharing a few resources with her on how he works and how men work. And I shared this book with her, The Way of the Superior Man by David Data, which is like a spiritual book about masculinity and feminine energy. And she ended up applying the things in that book, learning about him, understanding him, and just showering him with love where on a weekly basis, I would see the progression of him just going like, man, she is so sweet. And then she did this for me. And then she said that. And then I just, I just can't, like, I just don't want to see anyone else. She's amazing. She gave him everything a man could dream of. And he was able to receive it. He, in fact, reciprocated it. And I can already imagine that there's some women out there or men as well who are like kicking and screaming that say, listen, I did that with a person. They betrayed me. They hurt me and they ghosted me or whatever. It doesn't work. Don't give too much love. And of course, there are nuances to this. One of the nuances being if they don't receive it, they're not able to receive it and they don't reciprocate it, don't keep pouring into it. And the other nuance being oftentimes we think we're giving the opposite sex what they want, but it's not what they actually want. Because again, we don't really know. We haven't really studied them and gotten curious enough about them. Tony Robbins has a really good saying here that he keeps repeating in his relationship coachings and his live events, which is people always say, I gave them everything except for what they needed. And sometimes giving someone everything means also keeping them on their toes a little bit, right? Having a bit of distance, a bit of playfulness, a bit of cheekiness, and not showering them with love from an insecure place because that's what you're just comfortable giving, but giving them really what they really want. And sometimes that is, you know, things that are not natural to what you usually give or what you're comfortable giving. Another resource I think I want to dive deeper into on this channel, if women are interested, just comment below if you want to learn more about men and what they want, right? And guys, if you're okay with me sharing the trade secrets, I would love to have this woman on and her name is Alison Armstrong. And she's been studying men for decades. And she has a website, understandingmen.com. And it's easy to roll your eyes as a guy and be like, yeah, right, a woman that understands men, right? But she's legit. Men are way more complex than women think. What I've heard about Alison Armstrong from a friend of mine who has seen her at a conference is that she can make an entire room of grown men cry simply by the fact that they feel understood for the first time by someone who is open-minded and non-judgmental. And she has a map and stages of development for men that I think are really important for women to know about. She talks about this in her book, Keys to the Kingdom. And it's about the evolution from a page or a knight to a king. And one of the stages is being a knight, which is from puberty to late 20s or early 30s, where we're developing skills, competing, proving ourselves, and looking at just how we're comparing. And what we're optimizing for is adventure, fun, challenge, and passion. And before we become kings, the prince stage, for example, is the late 20s to early 30s, all the way through to the 40 to even mid 40s, which is where the focus is on who he wants to be in his life, what he wants to accomplish, and goes about bringing that to bear, even at the neglect of his wife and family, even though he says and truly believes he's working this hard for their benefit. If you're with a guy and he's in his prince stage, he's just 
taking every opportunity he can because he's terrified of missing something and leaving something on the table. Be honest about, does he want to commit? Does he really want to be with you? And there are definitely kings that, you know, are younger, but being a king is 40 plus. It's when they're confident who they are. They may not have acquired a lot of material wealth, but they're generous, whether with gifts, time, attention, or affection. Just knowing what stage a man is in and what he's currently focused on and what he's optimizing for, being able to support him in what he wants. What opportunities is he after and how can you support him in this stage of life? Even just knowing that men go through a tunnel phase when they go from prince to king, which is oftentimes known as midlife crisis, where they're just like, why did I do all this? Is this, is this what life is all about? Was it all worth it, all this work? to build this kingdom and um, he'll get out of the tunnel. But just knowing that during that time, he'll be distant, like just knowing that will support you so much in your relationship, in seducing a man, in knowing what he needs to be supported and for you to put your spell on him so that you give him things that no other woman can provide. And of course, I get it. It is scary to pour yourself into a person, to give them everything, to, to really invest into someone because what if they let you down? What if they reject you? If you pick the right person that exhibits good signs and healthy maturity, like my friend did, who reciprocated it and received the love, you're about to have a very fulfilling relationship. And if they truly care about you, you'll know, you'll see the signs and they'll respectfully and lovingly reject you if for whatever reason it doesn't work out. But that's love. That's part of it. It's opening your heart, investing into someone, potentially getting hurt, and then just continuing to do that. Even when you get stabbed, even when you get hurt, you continue to love. That's scary, that's rough, but that's what it is. And for men, the advice is pretty straightforward, but also quite eye-opening when you first realize it. Dude, 50% of guys aged 18 to 30 haven't approached a woman in the last year. Like if you're anywhere in that cohort and you complain about not having a girlfriend and not getting laid like, get in the sea like what are you doing what are we doing like if you're not putting yourself out there what do you expect oh well that's just a me too problem waiting to happen like if you approach a woman respectfully not in a dark alley late at night the the worst that's going to happen is you're going to be rebuffed right uh, and especially if you start going to somewhere like a CrossFit gym, which is kind of a co-ed mingled environment where everyone's sweating and high-fiving and all the rest of it, like you start a conversation about the clean and jerk numbers or some bullshit. And before you know it, maybe you're training together. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's, it's, it's not rocket science here. Learning to overcome approach anxiety through a CBT is a, a, a really great, uh, approach. The guy that created cognitive behavioral therapy created it with the expressed purpose of overcoming his approach anxiety for women. That's what it was originally created for. Like CBT was the original PUA, right? So I think that um, learning to overcome approach anxiety, uh, spending time with female friends, trying to get some female friends. So go to you know, like a yoga class or an art class and just have pl platonic relationships with women because what it does is it lowers the stakes of communicating with girls, but it means that you actually learn how they think and how to talk to them and kind of, you know, what the push and pull. Like you can't have, you can't do dick jokes and, and like fart all the time. Like that's not what girls find. Like your bro talk and your woman talk isn't, it doesn't work the same. So learn these skills. You can accumulate them in a low stakes environment by having female friends. And I, I think as well, you know, from guys that have checked out of the mating market because they feel like, all of the women are, all they're doing is chasing after Turbo Chad and how am I going to compete with, you know, a, a small army of Andrew Tates out there that are capturing all of the women's attention in this sort of digital harem. I don't think that the challenge is anywhere near as great as you think it is. And this is why I've stopped citing any data to do with Pareto principles, online dating, small numbers of men capturing all of the attention of women. I, Based on, if you really, really, really dig into the data, that doesn't seem to be the way that it's working. And 50% of American men are overweight, divorced, with less than 1K in the bank, right? That's half. That's the midpoint, right? Like, you... <laughs> separating yourself out from the pack as a guy has never been easier, I think. If you go to the gym three times a week for a year, you're in the top percentile, probably, of all fitness people in the United States. Like, realize how low of a bar that is to meet. 
if you learn the basics of understanding how to dress yourself, like, sorry, American men, you're not American, so I can say whatever I want. Uh, sorry, American men, like, y your fashion sucks for the most part. I'm not saying that I'm the most fashionable guy on the planet, but like an Under Armour polo shirt with jeans and leather shoes is not smart dress, okay? So learning a little bit of fashion, what suits your body. There's a great book by Tucker Max and Jeffrey Miller called Mate, What Do Women Want? Um, and it really breaks a lot of this stuff down. Uh, yeah, man, the, the, the bar has never really been set lower for guys. I'm aware that there is this sort of undercurrent of advice on the internet saying... Uh, if you're not earning a hundred grand a year and if you're not, you know, you've seen these on-street interviews with 19-year-old girls in colleges saying how much should your future partner make. Yeah, you, you can find outliers that say this sort of stuff. And women are very receptive to socioeconomic status. If you have the opportunity to increase your education level or increase your wealth, absolutely do pursue them. But you don't need to be, you, you can move yourself much further as a man on a 10 point attractiveness scale than you can as a woman, right? Fundamentally as a woman, what guys are looking for is youth and fertility, which is presented through the way that they look, which is why women spend way more money on cosmetics and men spend way more money on watches and cars. Yes, there are a lot of statistics that prove that it is hard, it is difficult, wah, wah, wah. But listen, 90% of businesses fail in 10 years. So should you never start a business? 50% of marriages end in divorce. Does that mean you shouldn't get married? Most people suck at what they do. Like you're, you're an individual. Those rules don't apply to you. Those are chances when you roll the dice for strangers, but we can take responsibility. There's so much we can do and stop getting skewed by these echo chambers that we see online because it is an echo chamber. It's not reflective of the, of the real world. The real world is very different than what we see in the viral clips, in the echo chambers that we're in, in the stuff that we see online. There's always a loud minority that I see, whether it's politically or with this dating stuff here that goes most viral, that skews the worldview of how society works. But when I go out into the real world, I don't see anyone who's crazy woke or has crazy opinions or crazy extremist or any of those things. Everyone I know is very balanced, except for a few small groups that I mostly see online and very rarely encounter in real life. And the same goes for the dating market. If you are not going out there and you're not approaching women, you're not allowed to complain. And whether you like it or not, online dating is the most common way of all the brackets that people meet nowadays. It's about 30 to 40% of couples, depending on what age group and statistics you look at, of course. And it doesn't even include Instagram, which arguably is the world's biggest and most successful dating app, because it is also a way to connect with people. Or if you meet someone in a bar on public, you connect on Instagram to look at what their life is like. The biggest challenge that I have encountered personally is just not having good pictures. I've just been too lazy to do it, but then I ended up meeting this guy who's a mutual friend of mine and his entire business is around optimizing men's dating profiles. And he helped me. And so here is me giving him a shout out. The cool thing is they're sending you a trained photographer for an afternoon to shoot hundreds of pictures of you in all sorts of scenarios. You gotta get a dog picture, gotta have a good suit one. One of your hobbies, in my case, Rollerblading, yes, I'm single-handedly bringing back rollerblading. It's my choice of transportation from and to the gym, especially on leg dates. It's very painful, I love it. They've turned it into a science because they know what pictures perform best, in what order, with which bio custom tailored to you and who you are and your hobbies and who you wanna attract. Minimizing the number of icks, so there's no small teeth pictures, there's no random cardboard boxes behind you. The usual clientele is actually men looking for a long-term partner, and that's what they're optimizing for. So I'll put a link in the description for you to check out if this is something that you're interested in. I highly recommend it. It saved me so many headaches and it was super easy, fast, and um, fun. Overall, as a society, I think the biggest challenge is really healing the relationship between men and women. We're all scared. We're all insecure. We've all been hurt in the past. And it's scary to be hopeful and invest into someone because what if they hurt us and they leave us and let me just go my own way and cap the level of happiness that I could have to just a low level of, I'm okay. I'm lonely, but I'm okay. I have two dogs and a cat and I'm okay, but I'm not really fulfilled and I don't really have the full juice of life. For me, I found that women add color to my life. If it was a world full of men, it would be quite gray. 
yes, we would build cities, we would conquer countries, we would wage wars, and we would achieve things, but it would be very gray and dull. And whenever I have a woman in my life, or I'm on a date with a feminine woman, everything just becomes bright and colorful and beautiful. What is life about if, if it's not about that? Like, why are we doing all of these things? Why are we achieving all of these things? Why are we working on ourselves if it's not to smell the roses? Which is what I think is a great metaphor for what feminine energy is. And for the women out there, what would life be like without any men? Would it really be that great? What about your fathers, your brothers? Maybe there was a man in your life who really rocked your world in a good way. What you see online are crazy echo chambers that if you go into the real world, it is very different. It's scary to be hopeful, but it's necessary to have a chance at a real, beautiful, fulfilling relationship with someone that we can share our lives with. I hope you found something valuable in this episode. I'll see you in the next one. Stay driven.